not being able to sleep and people are calling you a racist becomes clear how much I cared about what other people thought of me. So part of the protest was over a data fact, which was black men who start in the, like the sciences and economics at Duke, over half left for you know some other major. Only 8% of white men left. Mm -hmm. And that can be explained by differences in their academic background. If mm -hmm. you come in and you're on the low end of SAT math for your school, you're gonna be a lot less likely to stick it out. I think in academia, I think this is referred to as mismatch theory. One of the shocking things to me was that Harvard has an, uh, an athletic rating, and that athletic rating holds for everybody gets one, even for non-recruited athletes. And the people who do best on that are white legacies, which is pretty crazy because Harvard offers a bunch of sports like sailing and such that uh, you had to have lots of money uh, in order to access. Admitted to taking $610,000 in bribes to get students from wealthy families admitted into Stanford. There was actually a law school professor at Georgetown mm -hmm. who got caught on video. It, it's interesting. I hopefully don't get in trouble by saying this. Uh -oh. When women uh, were really constrained to be teachers, mm -hmm. that was actually really good for our public school systems because I met really good people who were teachers. And Wait, what do you really mean by that? <laughs> to, um, real quick, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody so they know who you are and have an idea of where to find you or if you want to plug a book or social media or anything, just so people have an idea of who you are? Oh, I wish I had a book to plug, but uh, I'm Peter Arsidiakono. I'm a professor of economics at Duke. I study affirmative action and was the expert witness in the students for fair admissions cases that were recently decided in the Supreme Court. I mainly did like the statistical analysis and such. Mm -hmm. Can you, um, just curious, so, uh, and then obviously if you're uncomfortable answering any question, you don't have to. Um, what were, have there been, before we get into the affirmative action thing, were there significant repercussions to your personal or professional life when you're testifying on behalf of affirmative action? Do other teachers or academics look at you a different way for that? It helps to be in an, e in an economics department. I've heard I this, think yeah. In a different department, that could be. You know, my history goes back a little bit further than this, because back in 2011, there was actually a protest here at Duke over one of my papers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there were like 30 students holding up signs on Martin Luther King weekend talking about how my paper was racist. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, prepared me for whatever was coming down the pipeline. I feel like uh, you know, I spent the first two weeks of that not being able to sleep when people are calling you a racist, you know, it really becomes clear how much I cared about what other people thought of me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I really feel like I got a grace to let it go. Um, and, you know, I still, we all have our flaws, but you know, still want to be liked. Yeah. Uh, fundamentally, if somebody was coming after me, I could take the hit and say, you know, we're actually on the same page on these things. Mm -hmm. We just disagree on the solution and, um, you know, we could, we could move forward by talking about what, what the data actually show. Sure. I mean, the paper that they got all upset about was written for economists. Economists have their, their ways of speaking about things. Mm -hmm. And they also tend to like to comment across every other discipline because they feel like their formulas give them the authority to pontificate on all matter of social issue, which I think is funny. I appreciate it. I think it's good. Um, and maybe me more than others because <laughs> yeah. okay, one of my sure. friends joked that I was uh, the best paid sociologist out there because, yeah. you know, you, Papers on teen sex, um, uh, you know, lots of different how people form friendships. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I say that whole lead theory, I think of, um, of of lead being the main driver of crime in the 90s and everything. I'm pretty sure that was an economist, I think, that was the progenitor of that theory. Um, yeah. So um, something that also just as a heads up, I don't know if I said this, this is I live stream this. So this is live. It's not like cut to and edited later on. So don't say anything Great. crazy or whatever. Yeah. Um, one theme that has kind of been consistent over the past couple of years um, as we analyze kind of universities and how much can you take up a contrary to the I'll say woke establishment opinion is we've noticed that increasingly uh, administrators seem to be unwilling to back faculty uh, and they kind of like bow to external pressures or 
don't want to say radical students. I feel like Rush Limbaugh. I'm using a lot of uh, conservative buzzwords right now. But um, obviously, yeah. you're at the center of what is arguably one of the most impassioned debates for school admissions related stuff and for social issues broader in the United States. Do you feel like as a as a professor, do you feel like, you know, you're school has your back you don't ever feel any pressure or threats from that or are you kind of like being a little bit more careful now yeah what is your general feeling on that well i'm certainly careful without a doubt mm -hmm. you know and that protest happened after i already had tenure okay so um that also helps uh, you know i am definitely in the minority you know i, I do careful for that word <laughs> I'm uh, I'm, you know uh, by definitely a conservative relative to the rest of, of academia. Uh -huh. And what's been great about being in economics most of the time is that I can still have those, you know, we can have those debates and I learn a ton. I probably learned so much because, you know, I have to actually defend my positions. One, uh, there's a guy, Mike Munger here, who argues it's not the conservative students who suffer from the woke establishment universities. It's the liberal students because they never learn how to defend their opinion. Sure. Um, but I, I definitely watch what I say. I thought there would be a lot of backlash in me doing this case. Um, it hasn't happened. You know, um, it, and if anything, I feel like I've been saved by some of the other work I did in this case, because as a result of getting to see all of Harvard's admissions data, I've written, I wrote papers about their legacy and athlete admissions. Uh -huh. So now they want to say my model is wonderful. Now that they want to go after uh, the legacy and athlete admissions, which gotcha. I'm supportive of uh -huh. <laughs> going after this. Okay, so focusing on affirmative action, I feel like the the steel man version, the best argument that I've heard in favor of affirmative action is when college admissions are looking at students that they want to enroll, there is a plethora of qualifications and experience that they take into account when they're processing these applications. Might be extracurriculars, might be whether you're a foreign exchange student, whether you're immigrant, whether you're whatever. There's a million things apparently that they'll take into account um, among like classes and test scores and everything. And affirmative action advocates say that of the, this mountain of things that are taken into account, it feels like say you've got two applications and everything is roughly equal, that a student coming from a disadvantaged or unprivileged minority background ought to be weighed a bit heavier than a student coming from a more uh, racially privileged background, I guess. That's like the steel man version of, I think, of affirmative action. Yeah, yeah what's your, um, yeah, I guess, so what is your like general response? Do you feel like it's bad, um, like morally and ethically? Do you think that just the pragmatics don't work? Like, yeah, how do you address in like a casual conversation or slightly more than casual conversation? So he brings this up. How do you feel about that? Yeah. Well, so I often take the cop out of saying, you know, that I'm not, you know, uh, taking up a particular side of the affirmative action debate, but mm -hmm. I'm a researcher of affirmative action. Mm -hmm. What bugs me about the debate is that people have really strong opinions on it. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, we have no idea how much it happens. So when you described it as like a like a tiebreaker, mm -hmm. that's an entirely different thing than like the Abram Kendi version of we're going to have a, a quota system. Mm -hmm. And so uh, because universities just hide their data, sure. you can't actually see how much it actually it actually matters. Mm -hmm. And it really ties in the paper that got me in, into trouble here was using Duke data. That's why there was a protest because I'm sort of pointing the fingers at Duke. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed and this, I think occurs at all college campuses. It's like the science and math classes and the economics classes, they're harder. You give lower grades and you study more. Mm -hmm. And that has a clear effect on who sticks in those fields. So part of the protest was over a data fact, which was for black men who start in the, like the sciences and economics at Duke, over half left uh, for you know some other major. Okay. Only eight percent of white men left, mm -hmm. and that can be explained by differences in their academic background. If mm -hmm. you come in and you're on the low end of SAT math for your school, you're going to be a lot less likely to stick it out. Now, part of what got me in trouble is saying, well, it, 
they thought that was victim blame. You know, fundamentally, it was the sciences and economics that were a hostile environment. Sure. And that's just not true. You know, the legacies with those test scores were leaving at the same rate. You know, it, once you account for the differences in academic background, uh-huh. race didn't matter. Gotcha. Uh, so for me, you know, I think everyone, uh, I can see the moral argument for saying we're not going to treat people differently based on their, their race. Uh-huh. But if you're pro affirmative action, I think you need to figure out at what point you think it would go too far. Mm-hmm. Now, somebody like Abram Kendi would say all the way until it's proportional. But then I think you're missing out on the fact that your preparation does matter. Yeah. Uh, Can I um, really trying to get at in terms of diversity? So something that you're kind of hitting on here, uh, I think in academia, I think this is referred to as mismatch theory, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, mismatch theory, especially with UC schools, is what I did reading on, I think, um, a year or two ago, and it kind of, it flipped my opinion on affirmative action. Um, because, uh, like you said, one of the frustrating things is for so many of these arguments, the arguments are purely normative or philosophical, and very rarely do we ever actually intersect with the data, which is arguably the most important point. And um, I think I got an email, I think somebody in my chat typed, like, how do you know if affirmative action is working or whatever? Um, and that was a good question. I was like, I actually don't even know. That's good. Because would we count admissions to a school? Would we count graduation rates? Um, would we count like, yeah, like, I, I'm not actually sure. And then I think the UC schools did a bunch of digging. And you're going to know this better than me. But I think that what they found was that uh, admissions for black students was dramatically increased with affirmative action policies, but the absolute rate of graduation stayed the same, and the per capita rate dramatically fell. So whereas you might enroll 20 students, with affirmative action you might enroll 40 students, and if you stop there, affirmative action has been immensely positive. But then when you look at the graduation rate, it's still just those five students. Well, now you've got mismatch. But I've also read contrary data that says, well, actually, um, and now these are papers that I think are more broadly theoretical. I don't know if they get into the numbers, but they make the argument that when you put students in accelerated learning environments, even if they do have some mismatch, just being in those environments benefits that student more than um, if they would have gone to another school. So broadly speaking, I guess, what you were alluding to earlier sounded similar, basically like mismatch theory. Where do you think we're at um, empirically on is the idea of mismatch theory true? Is it not accounting for some things? Or is it part true, part not? How do you feel about that? Well, I think it's clearly true. And it's always a matter of how far would you have to go for mm-hmm. it to kick in. Gotcha. So, you know, one of the papers, there's a guy named Zach Bleemer who wrote a paper that was saying that mismatch is sort of off. And uh, what he found is in California, when they removed uh, affirmative action, earnings for Hispanics um, went down. Uh-huh. What was interesting is that earnings for blacks did not. Uh-huh. And if you thought about affirmative action is way more aggressive for black students than for Hispanic students. Okay. So you could have had it be the case to have smaller preferences for black students. Then when you removed it, it would have led to um, earnings drops for African Americans, but uh-huh. it didn't. So that to me shows it went too far. If you're going to do things where you're going to end up, you know, with one and a half standard deviation worse on your uh-huh. academics background, that's going to go too far. It doesn't matter. Oh, wait, if, just so I can understand what you're saying then. because you're So the argument is saying that the affirmative action was so aggressive that when you got rid of the affirmative action, the earnings were unchanged, meaning that the prior affirmative action wasn't even boosting the earnings because the graduation exactly. was a job. Dep- okay, I understand. So ideally, if we peel away affirmative action, you would want to see earnings fall because that means that the affirmative action was having a positive effect on increased earnings. I understand. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Because, and it, it's got to be the case that if you're using affirmative action as a tiebreaker, mm-hmm. that's going to help minority students. Sure. You know, if, if it's just when it goes too far, and how can you ever tell when it goes too far when universities won't show you the data? Gotcha. You know? It sounds really similar to- And um, now what the UC has done- oh, Go ahead. Oh, now what the UC has done is said, we don't even want your test score data. Yeah. Which, Which is, I, I think some, I think MIT and other schools have rolled that back now though, right? Because I think they're like, yeah. this was stupid. Like test scores are probably important. Um, 
I hear a lot of people do the whole, I fight with my audience on this where people say like, oh, some people are bad test takers, but I think that's probably largely a cope. I think test, test scores are probably pretty important and indicative of a future student's success in school and everything. Um, yeah, and, and especially in the math and sciences. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and, and really, you know, people sort of view it as all the, the test scores favor the rich. And sure, they do favor they the do, rich. They do, because they prepare right. more, right? Yeah. Right, but the other stuff favors the rich way more. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, one of the shocking things to me was that Harvard, as part of how they rank their applicants, has an uh, an athletic rating, and that athletic rating holds for everybody who gets one, even for non recruited athletes. And the people who do best on that are white legacies, which is pretty crazy. Why? because Harvard offers a bunch of sports like sailing and such that uh, you had to have lots of money um, in order to access. Uh -huh. I can really boost up my resume much more if I've got money than I can my test scores. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of, um... oh shit. Almost all of my content is oriented around usually fighting with or disagreeing with people. So I'm trying to devil's advocate as hard as I can. Um, how do you feel? Uh, I'll ask kind of like general ideas about this because some of these things bother me, especially as I dive deeper into these, um, into a lot of these social issues. When, when, when schools are doing affirmative action, and I understand you're saying a lot of this data is hard to access, it feels very um, crude to have categories of like black or brown. So, for instance, a uh, um, an African American, somebody descended from slaves that might move out of Baltimore to go to school, is essentially on the same affirmative action level as uh, somebody who has two PhD Nigerian parents that came over to the United States and is enrolling them in school. Are all of these students just treated as black, or are the racial categories more granular when it comes to for the schools that were practicing affirmative action in their admissions? Do you know? Do you have access to that? Or do you have an idea? Oh yes, yeah. I mean black trumps everything. Okay, and um, you know, as it turns out, one study found that like over forty percent of Ivy League students who were, first, who were black were first or second generation immigrants. Generation. Yeah. And then to top it off, what we actually found in the Harvard data was you get like a really large bump if you're black, and then you get a small bump if you're from a poor family. But if you're black and poor, you don't get the poor bump. Interesting, okay. And so what that means is in terms of the racial advantage, it's going to be those two PhD Nigerian parents whose kids can have a, a more of an advantage relative to the p two PhD white parents uh -huh. than looking at the poor black kid versus the poor white kid. When schools are having, when you talk about the bumps that they're getting, are these bumps the end result of humans looking and kind of subjectively evaluating applications? Or is this like an actual formulaic, like black is plus 27 on your application, Asian is minus 12 on your application? Like, what, is there actually like formulaic stuff to do this? Or is it no. like the subjective feelings? Yeah. Yeah, because that's illegal. Uh -huh. Yeah. And if anything, I think that the University of Michigan cases got decided exactly wrong. So there were two cases that really set the tone for the recent rulings on affirmative action. One was uh, at the undergraduate level at Michigan, where they said you can't have an explicit point system like you just described. Yeah. Uh, but the other was that you can use it race holistically, which is what they were doing in the law school. Uh -huh. Now. As an economist, I just think it's ridiculous because we'll call it holistic if I just don't tell you what the formula is. Like cops so, having quotas for speeding tickets. They don't have quotas, but there are so many of them out there running speed traps. And it's like, if you don't write enough tickets, you get in trouble. But So it's effectively right. the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, racial preferences were much bigger in the law school than in the undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, yeah, it, we're, it looks, economists can model it as a formula anyway. Uh -huh. I wanted to hit on one big cost, though, um, because this this didn't get as much pushback as I think it should have when it happened. There was actually a law school professor at Georgetown uh -huh. who got caught on video lamenting how the performance of her black students. Yeah. And she got fired for that. Yeah, this was a few years ago, I think, right? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. 
it, to me, it actually shows what I view as one of the big problems with the affirmative action because no one knows how much it operates. The reality is, is it's huge at law schools and it's going to be a feature, not a bug that you're going to end up. If you're coming in behind, you're going to be at the bottom of your class. Yeah. That could still be good because you still graduate from Georgetown with a law degree uh -huh. and get those good outcomes, but you are going to have lower grades. Sure. Georgetown's response to this was, she's racist and we need to figure out whether this is happening elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But they never released the data, so you can't show that wh what's happening in her class is happening in, in all their classes, and they just uh, they hide it. Yeah. Yeah, The um, you mentioned this, that you have the same goals as a lot of these people. One of the things we talk about on my stream is um, rather than being tied to outcomes, people get really tied to processes, and they'll confuse the process with the outcome. So when when we don't we shouldn't really be talking about if we like or don't like affirmative action normatively we should be talking about do we want more students to go to college successfully but people confuse that with the process and then it becomes if you're opposed to affirmative action it's because you're racist or don't want equal opportunity for students and it's very frustrating to kind of like peel the layers of onions back to try to get into a person's mind and be like you could be opposed to this thing but not because you hate these students but because you realize it's like an ineffective means of addressing i guess these types exactly. of exactly yeah. And, and you know, the, with the re conservative response on a lot of these things is we have to deal with the pipeline. Yeah. But then the liberals will see that as a cop out because do they ever actually do anything about the pipeline? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's my big problem with conservatives. It, it, it happens a lot. I'm sorry. I've drawn a lot of peripheral um, economic and uh, uh, po political issues because they always like tie into each other. But it reminds me of when conservatives will say, like, we shouldn't be spending so much money in Ukraine because we need to spend domestically. But then when you ever look at domestic spending, conservatives cool. don't want to allocate more money to the things that they say we should be. Yeah. So, yeah, it's one of those things. Um, I agree with the pipeline thing. It seems to me. Um, as, as not an educator, but just as somebody that went to school and saw different families and see things that like so much of like a child's success is determined at very early ages. I feel like you hear these really dumb things that are said over and over again, like high school isn't important. You're just learning how to learn and grade school is just teaching you how to sit in class and blah, blah, blah. But like I remember, I'm pretty sure advanced placement for math starts in like fourth or fifth grade. Like at very early ages, you can kind of tell like this kid is in sixth or seventh grade and he can't really read. Like it seemed, yeah. Affirmative action always seemed to me like a very brutal band aid at the end of a long chain of fuck ups that now you can just catch up at this point. And it's like, there's just no yeah. way. Yeah. And then obviously, right, being an economist, like now you've got all these negative externalities that are happening as a result of forcing that so hard. It's like setting minimum wage so far from where the market would set it. And then you see these horrible outcomes where black students aren't achieving as much, where people feel like people are just getting affirmative action in. And yeah, just all the knock on effects are so horrible. Yeah. Um, I actually like that minimum wage analogy there because imagine saying I'm for or against the minimum wage. Minimum wage. What imagine, is that even? <laughs> imagine setting, wait, what'd you say? Sorry, imagine. Imagine saying I'm for minimum wage or I'm against the minimum wage. Oh, yeah. Well, what, what does that even mean? It, it depends on what level you set it at. Exactly. Yeah. In favor of a $30 minimum wage because that would be a train wreck. Yeah. You know? But it sounds like what you mentioned with the affirmative action for the Hispanic and black students because I think, I think now it's agreed. Obviously, you've got the econ background, so you can always tell me if I'm completely wrong. But I think economists agree that setting a minimum wage slightly above like the market floor where it would naturally settle is probably beneficial to workers. It doesn't seem like there's too many bad uh, external effects that happen from that. But the farther you get away from that, I think in Seattle, they tried a lot of experiments. Then you start to yeah. see increases on unemployment, decrease in hours given, um, which reminds me of the affirmative action thing that you mentioned with Hispanic and black students, that for Hispanic students, they might not have been having that much affirmative action, um, but between getting in or not getting in, but the farther away you got, the more deviations away you get, the more extreme the external negative effects are gonna be for the impact on students and graduation rates and everything. Yeah, and I think that those get magnified when you're hiding it from them so that they don't, you know, they don't know what's going on here. They mm -hmm. think they're gonna come in and, and, and do fine, and then that doesn't work. If, if they knew their math background was behind, mm -hmm. then you could get the resources in the summer before or whatever, to try to make sure that they're going to succeed, um, yeah. they won't do that. Sure. Yeah. And and honestly, that sounds like a more even a hardcore race based affirmative action program like that. 
I'd be more in favor of. If there was like a blacks only accelerated math prep course between like senior year of high school and going into college or whatever, like I'd probably be more on board with that because then at least you're preparing students. You're not just throwing them into environments where they're kind of like set up to fail. Yeah. Do you want um, to my big complaint against universities is universities hide their data. You know, if you think at Duke, we house all the North Carolina education data, so all public school students, you can do whatever research you want nice. to improve those public education. Mm -hmm. And yet we don't look at our own data at all to help our own students. Yeah. Uh, which seems crazy. Every university should be using their data. They've got professors who would look at it for free to try to improve uh, the educational outcomes of their students. We asked for that data for to help improve minority outcomes in our major. Mm -hmm. At first they gave it to us and then, then the well dried up. Yeah. Um, I, th I remember reading a quote a long time that if you pulled somebody from the 1800s and you transported them 200 years into the future today, that uh, the only thing they would recognize would be the education system. Because <laughs> it seems like we're so reticent to make any dramatic changes in literally anything relating to it, at least in the United States. Um, yeah, charter schools have picked up steam. And um, my read on that is that certain kinds are very successful in closing that achievement gap. Uh -huh. But they get such uh, pushback you know, from teachers unions, unions and such, it's, it's too bad because these no excuse charter schools make a, make a big difference. What do you, um, I'll give my, this is my steel man argument against charter schools and then you can tell me if you agree or disagree. Um, my understanding of a charter school is a charter school is, I believe it's a school that can choose who to admit but they still get public funds, I believe, right? You can set it up so that's not the case. Okay, you have sure. to make that uh, everybody or there'll be a lottery for it. Sure, uh, yeah. But, but still, um, they still may not put out the resources to handle like a disabled student. Sure, so yeah. That, that's the tricky part. I feel like um, the thing that I don't like about charter schools, um, so I'm digging into the ethics part here, is in my mind, I would like it to be that if a student has the aptitude has the support of their family, if they go to school and they apply themselves, I feel like education should be this like great equalizer, that every student goes to school and has the ability to perform, achieve, and they have the opportunity everything there to, to, to make it as far as they could in life if they were born to an ultra wealthy family. And I think the thing that makes me sad sometimes about like school vouchers, like school choice or charter schools, is it feels like we're essentially saying, listen, we're gonna relegate, you know, 20, 30% of our schools is just being shitholes that some poor people are gonna be trapped in. But if you're lucky, or if you get a voucher, you can go to one of these good schools where the real education happens. And I feel like that type of behavior shifts away the most important people who are like the wealthiest, the whitest, the most affluent people from being motivated in changing those public schools. That like, like I went to a, I got, I'm very lucky, you know, my parents sacrificed a lot. And I was able to go to a private high school growing up. If all of those kids in my private high school would have been thrown into the public, the, I was in Omaha, the Omaha public school system, man, I know that more changes would have happened in that public school system because those families wouldn't tolerate some of the standards that existed there, you know, the, the 40%, you know, reading rates from eighth grade students or whatever, you know, like it would, it would be changing. Yeah. What, what's your, how do you feel about, yeah, those types of arguments or how do you tackle with that? Oh, yeah. The thing is, there's already that private school market. So uh -huh. you can't, the rich are already escaping. If you can do things to draw them back in, you uh -huh. might really improve the public school system. And the thing is, public schools, you know, I went to a suburban public high school that was really good. Uh -huh. That suburban public high school really competes with other high schools uh, because the rich can move. Yeah. With these poor schools, they're really operating more like monopolies. And so by putting in charter schools, you introduce competition, which can actually improve the quality of those crappy poor schools. Does, if you do it right. Wasn't that kind of the idea though behind No Child Left Behind? Was this idea that competition between schools and test scores could drive up performance? Didn't, that, didn't it end up being that like, for whatever reason, that they just don't function as efficiently that way in competitive environments? Well, when, when you tie it to specific measures that are not really great mm -hmm. for what we're going to close down the schools and then you never actually close down the schools. Sure. Uh, I mean, that's a big problem is how do you actually measure the quality, mm -hmm. quality of these places? Yeah. But I think the effects, you know, for no child left behind, I mean, again, it's really hard to legislate something like that. Sure. Um, 
more more having the states like Florida, where you have a, those charter school systems, those things can work really well. Do you think charter but, schools, or sorry, finish your thing, go ahead. Uh, but I think you want to create the right incentives. So if the charter schools can just cream skim the top students by locating um, away from the poor, mm -hmm. that's a problem. And one of the issues with, with those Florida charter schools, the fact is you should spend more money per person on a poor kid than on a rich kid mm -hmm. because they actually are more costly to educate. Um, that's not how these systems are set up. Your yeah. reimbursement rates are per pupil. Mm -hmm. You could get charter schools to focus on the poor kids by changing how you did the reimbursement rates. Gotcha. Okay. Because that was going to be my question, because it would feel like if I'm going to go set up a charter school in a city, I'm I'm going to the richest kids so I can charge the highest tuition. And I know I'm going to have like the best. I was like, why would I ever set up a charter school in an economically disadvantaged area? Like, I don't know if charter schools are similar to private schools, but I know, for instance, in private schools, unintuitively, I think teachers tend to actually make less money than public school counterparts. Uh, but they but they choose to work in the private schools because the environment is so much better. Um, and, and I guess there's more job yeah. satisfaction or whatever. So yeah, I feel like I feel like the incentives, if the incentives were right for for doing the charter schools in in more economically disadvantaged areas, I'd be okay with it. But I feel like right now, um, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like right now, like charter schools and even good public schools just continue to drive a bigger wedge between the, the poor and the wealthies. Like you said about like um, my kid, again, I, my, my child lives in Omaha where I lived. Um, I just bought a house in the best school district because I don't want him to go to a shitty public school. And some of and the public schools in the rich yeah. districts are really good. Um, yeah, and if my, and I imagine if I wanted to send my kid to a, yeah, to a public school, I'd move to a good area. And then if a charter school was setting up, yeah, I don't know why they would ever set up in an economically disadvantaged area. Why would you do that to yourself? Yeah. Well, I mean, some of these charter school chains, that's their purpose is yeah. to, you know, that's a way of giving back for some of these places is to set, is to set up uh, one of these schools. Um, but you're totally right. The teachers uh, prefer to work with kids that aren't going to cause problems mm -hmm. and, and whose parents who uh, are in a position to help out. Mm -hmm. Do you, What do you think is um, two questions that kind of uh, bounce off each other? Uh, the first one is like, is there is there like some empirical data driven this is a change that we should absolutely make to our schooling system k through bachelors that we're just not doing that would be really good to push for and then the second thing is like are there changes that we're making now that you're excited about for the future yeah what do you think for, for either of those well see most of my work's on the higher education side so i can really only answer the sure the, the, the first part of the question in, in my mind the first part of the question really hits on this idea of, you know, we, we have to target the resources, re recognize that the poor are more costly to educate, first mm -hmm. of all. So then you provide the appropriate incentives to do that. Mm -hmm. But there's another problem with that too, which is giving them the right information. Um, a lot of these times the parents have no idea what um, these schools are like. And so, you, you know, you've got to, you've got to make it clear, um, yeah, what, what these schools are actually doing that's, that uh, is worth them having their kids go there. Mm -hmm. I think Chile provides a great example of how to structure these things in better ways. Though even then, the targeting the resources to the poor uh, could be better. Are, you, have, are there other countries that you think have solved unique problems in education that um, the United States could learn from? Like I know oh, in, okay. yeah, go ahead. Finland. <laughs> yeah, okay, fine, that was gonna be. Okay. Yeah. And what they've done there, it, it's interesting. I hopefully don't get in trouble by saying this. Uh -oh. When women um, were really constrained to be teachers, mm -hmm. that was actually really good for our public school systems because I met really good people who were teachers. And Wait, what do you really, mean by that? <laughs> um, that teachers don't get paid that much. And yeah. so like, if you're really strong at math and such. Mm -hmm. You could do better in other other areas um, oh this is why i understand what you're saying like i've heard that econ related teaching jobs or like mba related teaching jobs that those jobs can pay more because if you're really good in these fields sometimes you can just go work in the private sector and why would you be a teacher if you can yeah i understand this okay exactly like my kids humanities teachers are mm -hmm. incredible mm -hmm. uh, yeah <laughs> More likely to have PhDs. Yeah. You know? If a guy is teaching you like Russian literature, then this guy probably has read every.
book ever written by yeah sure i understand what you're saying yeah yeah so are you saying math, in, you often get in somebody who's really a music teacher teaching math sure so are you saying in finland that restricting it to women was good just because of the artificial oh, restriction no, on the labor that, supply that was, like a, that was more of a historical comment in finland okay. they pay their teachers well oh okay gotcha it's actually really competitive so that's the other that's the way of getting around this is to make it so that you're not that it is an attractive mm -hmm. uh, why I mean, um as i benefit so much from the fact that universities don't let us have that many phd students to keep flooding the market with humanities phds yeah that keeps salaries low in humanities and high high in econ sure and, and probably even more important than the number of phds is probably the number of private sector jobs that those phds would excel in outside of the university exactly. is probably the big driver right yeah yeah what um um, what, I'm getting really heavy into policy and political questions, so obviously, yeah. Why do you think teachers don't get paid that much in the United States? I believe they're on the lower end of four-year bachelor compensation, I think, compared to other like STEM degrees or other, I think, related education degrees. Why, why do you think that is? Is it just like unions negotiating against cities, or am I wrong on that factoid? Or? Well, I think part of it is... Um the way the marriage market works right so oftentimes they're married to somebody who's making uh is is the primary breadwinner mm -hmm. um, and there's enough you know it's all demand and supply right that mm -hmm. if there's people willing to do it at that low wage uh, we can still sort of clear the market we you know if we're gonna up uh you, you could up the competition for teachers quite a bit if you raise the salaries a lot there will be a lot of teachers who would like to teach you who now won't be able to. Yeah. And one of the key things would be to make sure you actually are able to select the good ones from that. Um, Am I making? I don't know enough about is how Finland's able to select the good ones. Yeah, I was going to ask that. I, I don't remember making this up, but what, did, was Finland the country where they required? I thought there was one of the Nordics, well, Scandinavian or Nordic. I think Finland is Nordic, but not Scandinavian. Was Finland the country that made it so in order to be any type of teacher at all, you have to have a master's equivalent? I... That could be, mm -hmm. but the way that system works, yeah, you, and it has to be in education. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, that's not really the case uh, you know, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's very selective to get into the Finnish uh, system as a teacher. Gotcha. Um, do you think that... Um... Do we spend, my impression is, I could be wrong, my impression is, like so many things in the United States, we spend a lot of money on things, we don't get the best outcomes. So for instance, for healthcare, we dwarf like every socialized country, I think, when it comes to spending overall on healthcare. But our healthcare outcomes are comparable, roughly comparable to, to other countries that spend way less than us. I think it's similar for education. Is that true? Or do we spend way less than other countries? Well, you know, I, I think the big thing is it's it's uh, all in the variance. I think, sure. you know, at the top end, we're spending quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And, and, yeah, I think that's all I really have to say on that. You okay. Because my next question is going to be, and this is probably targeted more towards higher education, college on onwards, although I've heard complaints in public school, is do you have, like, opinions or thoughts on, like, kind of the ballooning cost of college education? where it's, we're very closely, we're starting to creep into these territories where classes of students now, like people, for instance, going to out-of-state schools, the wage premiums conferred by those bachelors are almost getting matched now by the amount of debt and debt payments that they're making compared to like a high school earner, where that's starting to happen a bit, which before was like unquestioned. Um, yeah, what do you think about the idea of like, yeah, I guess like ballooning cost of education? What, and I understand this is like, this is pretty out of the affirmative action thing, so if you don't have a strong opinion on that, that's fine. but. Oh, yeah. I mean, the administrative bloat is mm -hmm. uh, an increasing problem. And then at the very top schools, there's also they end up competing on crazy things. Like Duke has a hundred million dollar dining facility, you know. Really? A uh, hundred million yeah. dollar dining facility? That's how much it costs to, to set up their dining facility, you know. Okay. It, uh, it's crazy how nice the resources uh nice resources are here but the other catch to me it's all about your major you know so uh, the differences in, in pay for majors is uh, 
way more important than, in my view, than what you see across schools. Sure. Um, so if, if you end up going in computer science, that, that that's going to take care of itself. If you're doing something in the humanities, it, you're going to have a problem. Uh-huh. Do you, what do you and, think? And universities don't tell students that. I mean, people know, mm-hmm. but they don't know just how big those gaps are. Yeah. Uh, in my kid's school, we would have somebody come over and then they'll say, your major doesn't matter. And then I'd go visit the econ class and say they lied to you. It does matter. Mm-hmm. You know? Do you, um, on that topic, do you, do you um, how do you feel about students selecting like high school, I guess, or not high school, how do you feel about them selecting college majors based purely on, I guess, like economic incentive? Do you think that should be the goal for all of college or for certain students? Oh, or, no. Yeah. No, but yeah, they also shouldn't lie to them about it. Either. True. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, you know, I could probably make more money in consulting, but I like my professor lifestyle. Sure. Um, um, but it might be more fun for me to teach a history class, right? I mean, you can tell stories all the time. Instead, I'm like writing equations up on the board. Yeah. True. Yeah. Um, do you? Um, uh, for for the affirmative action stuff, um, bringing it back to the affirmative action, for, now that it's, my understanding is it's basically going to be eliminated in the United States now, correct? Like mo- schools aren't going to be allowed to consider race-based stuff for applications, at least on paper. Yeah. So my, my view is if you want a little bit of affirmative action, you should ban affirmative action because they're going to they're gonna figure out ways to get around it. Uh, sure. Without it. And some schools more so than others. Uh, is there like a particular... Is there like a particular style of affirmative action or something that you think would be beneficial that let's say I'm very progressive, I've still got the black square up for BLM on my Instagram, like I wanna you know, see minorities succeed in the United States. Is there some form of affirmative action that you feel like a person can feel good advocating for that has some kind of empirical backing as well? Or do you think all of it is just kind of like garbage and you just shouldn't even have your mind there at all if, you, if you're trying to- Well, I mean, a little, bit, a little bit is definitely gonna help. Mm-hmm. I think it's interesting that we focus so much on admissions because to me, what you ought to be focusing more on would be the costs. I mean, like you just said, mm-hmm. uh, we'll see whether those come under fire as well. Like if you have scholarships for black students, but I think there are easy ways around that legally um, for schools. If the school itself can't give scholarships on the basis of race, they could easily have an external organization do it. Mm-hmm. What, whatever, I always forget the name of this, the ND, the, the NAA. college athlete, yeah, the, where you pay the college athletes. Yeah. They have those agreements now. Mm-hmm. Those are separate from the school itself, right? I think uh, they get paid for by um, an outside organization. You could do that on scholarships, and mm-hmm. I think that that would be more promising. When you talk. In mind, affirmative action doesn't affect whether uh, black kids go to college. It affects where they go to college. Gotcha. Okay, true. Um, when you talk about, um, one of the things you talked about in contrast with affirmative action are legacy admissions. Do you think that yeah. would legacy, um, oh, okay, I'm going to be honest. I've been doing a lot of other non-political content, so I haven't followed the Supreme Court case as much. Was affirmative action struck down as a violation of, like, equal protections, or what did the Supreme Court... Yeah, like um, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so, okay. um, Now that people are challenging, like, legacy admissions, I'm guessing that that's probably not... Nobody would expect that to see the same type of Supreme Court challenge, right? Is this just, like, a thing that people want to see, like, gone, and they're hoping colleges take... Uh, step to remove it? Do you think colleges will remove it? Why do legacy admissions even exist? Is it for rich alumni to donate to the school or what? Yeah. So that wasn't part of the lawsuit because legacy is not a protected class. Yeah. Uh, but there are now lawsuits going forward on uh, legacy admissions. And I think they've got a nice argument, which is disparate impact. You know, that legacy admissions uh, disparately, uh, you know, affects, negatively affects minority students and you don't have to have a good reason for doing it. Now, the counter to that is that universities may actually have to show that they do have a good reason for doing it, and they're going to make arguments along the lines of the donations. Mm-hmm. The literature is sort of mixed on on that. I mean, it, to me, it sort of makes sense that their donations will be higher um, because they're coming from richer families. Uh, the poor family that sends their kid uh, to Harvard may also... Uh, donate some, but they're not going to donate the same level as a rich family. 
Yeah. To me, that's just sort of crazy in the first place because it's a way to get around the taxes. You make those tax deductible gifts and then your kid gets in, sure. you know. Um, you had that whole varsity blues thing. That was actually not for the super rich. The super rich would have just given the money to Harvard directly, mm -hmm. gotten their kid in and uh, been able to write it off on their taxes. Yeah. Um... Do you, so do I'm not in favor of the legacy admissions. Mm -hmm. uh, I see some advantages to it, but the bigger problem is, is it destroys trust in higher education. Sure. Like you see that the, the system's rigged. Um, Could you make arguably the same argument that like, just because you're, because I think you said earlier empirically that legacy admission students have similar troubles making it through college as affirmative action in students. Did you say that or am I making that up? No, they don't. They don't. Um, but that's because when you say that statement, it's almost like an on average yeah. statement. Mm -hmm. but, and, but legacies are coming from incredibly wealthy, uh, well advantaged families. Gotcha. So it's not going to be the average. It's going to be sort of the, you know, bottom quartile of them. You know, bottom twenty five percent. That's where you you would see them struggle as well. The difference, of course, is daddy can still get your job afterwards. Uh, if you if you struggled there, sure. So you know those advantages are going to help you in the labor market anyway. Do you just curious? Do you know what percentage of overall like on average? And I'm sure it varies. But we'll say like on Ivy League schools, what percentage of admissions are legacy admissions? Is this like two percent or like fifteen percent or? At Harvard, you're talking more like fifteen percent. Okay, geez, uh, that's significant. Okay. So the the stat that gets uh, one of the most Stunning stats from our paper was 43% of white admits to Harvard are either recruited athletes, legacies, children of donors, mm -hmm. or children of faculty and staff. 16% um, of white admits to Harvard are recruited athletes. Gotcha. That that uh, number is way less for all other other groups. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, do, so being the economist you are, uh, do you think that at some point, do you think that market forces would actually cause pressure, reverse pressure? Uh, against legacy admissions on these schools. So say at some point, um, market forces dictate that a Harvard degree is not actually worth as much as we thought it was because these workers aren't outperforming the other people. Do you think there would ever be like a reverse pressure to where Harvard is like, okay, well, we need to chill on these legacy and athletic admissions because the value of our degree is actually falling and it's hurting our ability to be, you know, competitive in the market? Or do you think the markets are just too disconnected or inefficient for like this type of thing to trickle down? It, I think it's tough for it to, to trickle down like that. I don't think that, I think there are reasons why the legacy preferences will go away. Mm -hmm. Uh, it won't necessarily be those. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can actually see uh, a lot of a lot of law schools and medical schools are now pulling out of the U.S. News and World Report rankings. Um, and that's because the U.S. News and World Report was revealing things like starting salaries and such. Mm -hmm. And those schools wanted to, um, you know, promote more social justice stuff and jobs where they're not going to pay as well. Sure. And so they're trying to sort of hide the fact that the degree isn't going to be worth as much in the marketplace. Uh -huh. um, but the pressure to get rid of legacy admissions is going to be coming from other places. Like as soon as one school does it, you know, they're immense, they're unpopular among the student bodies, uh -huh. schools and the alumni. Um, it sort of amazes me that Congress hasn't passed something on this because who anybody who votes against it is not going to look look very good. You could say we're not going to give federal funding to places that have legacy admissions. Uh -huh. That's no different than like Title IX, right? Title IX made it so that all these schools that wanted federal funding had to uh, have women's sports at some equal rate to men's. Uh -huh. um, why, why we don't do that with these other things, I don't, I don't know. You mentioned that um, Duke has like all the data for the school stuff. Would you support some type of like federal provision or some type of law, maybe contingent on receiving like federal aid or federal loans that like we need more transparency about? Oh, yeah, that yeah. would be that would be amazing. 
It'd be nice to look up like a school and go, I want to go to UCLA. I want this degree. What are the average earnings four years out of graduates that have this degree? Having that information at your fingertips would be nice. Yeah. They have some of that on this college scorecard, but it's just not enough, Mm -hmm. you know, because again, it's like, it's not whether the UCLA graduate would make that money in computer science. It's whether I would make that money if, you know, if, if I went there. And what my probability of graduating would be if I went there with my particular test scores, Mm -hmm. you know, you, you could give that information to students upon, you know, when they're deciding whether they're going to accept, you say, given your care, your grades and your test scores, here's the probability you'll actually make it in economics. Uh, And if you don't make it in economics, here's the probability you drop out and then students make up their own mind uh, where to go. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you could get really granular with that data and like very like if I've got a 3.2 GPA and a 32 ACT score and a whatever on the SAT, what are the, what's the likelihood that I graduate from whatever school? Um, It'd be nice. You can plug that in and and, uh, and just see it. Yeah. And I guess it sucks, too. The, actually, the saddest part about that is that the, the formula for that would be trivial and the data already exists. It's just not in a database somewhere where we can just like, yeah, yeah access it. Yeah. And, and the thing is, what I thought you were going to say about the saddest part is, is the people who um, don't have the information are exactly the disadvantaged ones. Mm-hmm. You know, I know, sorry, mm-hmm. what to tell my kids because I'm familiar with the system. Um, if you're from a poor family, you're not going to, you're not going to know. Sure. Yeah. Um. Hmm. Well, do you feel like that's a big, um, uh, there's like a bunch of like random questions I can ask you about tenure, professorship. Um, there's obviously like there's the today and in, in, in politics, the only thing we talk about are cultural issues because Republicans have nothing else that they want to focus on right now. Um, so I guess um, when, when you talk about like affirmative action issues like these, uh, I know that you mentioned that you're, you tread carefully uh, in certain areas. Do you feel like it's kind of the norm that the faculty uh, no, 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 not the faculty, I'm sorry, uh, that the administrators tend to side more with like student body on issues or is it like 50-50 or what do you feel like that pressure looks like at schools? I think there's just a lot of fear. Uh-huh. Um, you know, lots of people in university would consider themselves progressive and so then when you go against something that's even more progressive, you're like, wait, how can I be on the on the not progressive side of this issue? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm involved with the Christian faculty group and I asked, the, you know, the other people there, would you feel comfortable saying anything publicly about, you know, the trans issue mm-hmm. and they, they wouldn't want to touch it. Yeah. Uh, that's an issue that, that people won't, uh, you know, won't discuss at all. Uh, even if they're putting forth, would be a majority opinion on something like sports or, how early are you going to intervene? Uh-huh. Uh, but professors, you know, don't want to be seen as being haters uh, there. Um, when and- you say, just here's a quick question, on that, okay? Because I come from uh, gaming, esports, teams, and everything. When we get scared in our industry, we're worried about like losing sponsors and stuff, right? That people are going to pull out. What do you? Yeah. What are people scared of in colleges? Like when they're like, there's a lot of fear. Tenured professors. What? <laughs> Particularly tenured. Yeah, no, but I'm asking, like, what is the school afraid of? Like, okay, the the students aren't happy. It's not like the school's not like losing sponsors or have have there been like successful successful like school boycotts where people like aren't going to a school anymore because of a protest about like a particular social issue or an anthropology department or a CRT feeling. Like, is this ever? I'm curious, like, how that pressure manifests. Is it all like on social media and in the minds of the? Uh, administrators and the students there or where yeah where does this come from like what is the like why do they why do they feel the need to act yeah yeah because i think they're afraid of protests Mm -hmm. and um you know and that stuff does happen so they they would just like to avoid uh the controversy as much as possible Mm -hmm. Uh, but you're right you wouldn't think it would affect the bottom line that much and if anything i think um by giving into a lot of this stuff they lose donors. Sure. You know, the reality is I think Duke should make a ton of money off of me from donations. They're not going to use me for that. Sure. Uh, at all, because 
that money would be tainted. <laughs> sure. And even, I don't know where you stand politically, but I'm sure there's a lot of like conservative-esque groups that would be happy to <laughs> support like the research and the work and everything you're doing. It would probably be overall beneficial to Duke. Um, but then, yeah, you get into the fights of who can you accept money from? What does it say about your university? And what, what people do you have to fight with over it? Yeah. Um, 